Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Cloud Native Live. Uh, my name is Mario Laura. You've seen me before, I'm sure. Uh, I've been hosting Cloud Native Live on and off uh, since we started uh, the Cloud Native TV network this year. Um, thank you so much for joining us for another wonderful episode where we are going to dive into chaos engineering. Um, so today I have Karthik with me from uh, Chaos Native, uh, and they're a company that is working on resilience engineering um, in our world of cloud native and leveraging a chaos uh, engineering to achieve that with their product Litmus Chaos. So I'm going to be, uh, I'm not going to get into Karthik. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to answer all of your questions. Please leave your questions in the platform of your choice that you're using to watch this right now. We thank you for tuning in and spending time with us uh, today. Uh, this is going to be a really, really fun session. I have a lot to learn. Um, I know of chaos from uh, the uh, Chaos Monkey project uh, on GitHub um, and other talks from, from Netflix engineers like Adrian Cockroft uh, and others who have been pushing for uh, chaos to increase resiliency and reliability of your platform. Uh, very, very difficult to hone in and get uh, just right. And it's also very scary for a lot of organizations uh, knowing where uh, companies I've been in SRE at, you know, what they've been able to do and what they've been comfortable with doing, uh, introducing chaos is actually really scary. Uh, and it's hard to take that first step. So uh, I think Karthik is going to be teaching us a ton of great stuff. Uh, I'll let leave him to get into his background. Uh, but I again, I thank everybody for joining. Please leave your questions, comments, thoughts um, in the chat. And I am monitoring those. So I will be sure to um, get those questions asked. Uh, to Karthik, and we'll be kind of going through a wide gamut of uh, different areas uh, in chaos engineering, the ecosystem, and cloud natives role. So thank you so much. Uh, please join the public uh, Slack channel, hashtag cloud native live as well. Uh, if you want to chat with more people, I think myself, Karthik, and others uh, that have been on the show are definitely, uh, definitely hanging out there. Uh, and check out Chaos Native while, while you're watching, uh, at Chaos Native, at Litmus Chaos on Twitter, um, chaosnative.com. Um, I, I'm scrolling through here and I even see Victor Farsik from the, I think, DevOps Exchange podcast uh, has even done a episode on integration with Argo workflows, which is super exciting and I didn't know existed and I use Argo. So uh, I have a lot of work to do this week to share this with my team, I think. Without further ado, Karthik, thank you so much for joining us. I'll let you take it away. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mario. Really excited to be part of uh, CNCF Live and uh, discuss chaos engineering and it was chaos. Thank you for the introduction. Um, like Mario said, my name is Karthik. I work for a company called Chaos Native and um, I'm one of the maintainers of the open source uh, CNCF sandbox project called It Was Chaos. And um, today we just want to discuss uh, what um, Cloud Native Chaos Engineering is and talk about Litmus project. Uh, there has been um, a new version that was released just early or late last week, I should say. So Litmus 2.0 is out and uh, it has some uh, improvements over the earlier version, uh, Litmus 1.x. And uh, I think in the process of talking about the project, I'll just introduce you to uh, what Redmond's Pond.x did and uh, what is the feedback that we received from the community and how 2.0 was brought up, how it was created, and uh, we'll go through a couple of demonstrations to just discuss about what this platform is about. And uh, I hope this uh, uh, encourages you to start with your chaos engineering journey in your organizations. So please feel free to ask us any questions and be happy to answer. And uh, yeah, that's about it. All right, uh, with that said, uh, I just want to introduce what chaos engineering is. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks uh, already know about chaos engineering. You might be practicing chaos engineering also, you might be practitioners, or you might have heard about it, read about it. Mario mentioned about Adrian Cockcroft and Netflix. They were really the pioneers that sort of started the movement uh, of chaos engineering. And um, Netflix, along with a few of the other organizations, early adopters of chaos came and created the basic tenets of uh, chaos engineering. Uh, you can look at this website called the principles of chaos.org, which carries a lot of information about 
what it is, why it is important, what are its principles, etc. Um, there is a brief summary. Uh, I have a couple of slides which I just will uh, use to talk about chaos engineering and state of chaos engineering today with all the cloud native revolution that is going on. So I hope my um, screen is visible. Uh, okay, I'm hoping that the screen is going to be visible. Let me just quickly run through this. So one of the basic reasons why chaos engineering is very important is because downtimes are very expensive. We had um, we have had some past incidents uh, in organizations that are generally very resilient, where it has cost uh, a lot of money because of downtime, and uh, that is something we would want to avoid. We would like to test out how the system behaves to different kinds of failures and how the deployment environment can be improved and how the application resilience can be improved in order to withstand this turbulence and still be available. A lot of uh, services that we're consuming on a day-to-day -day basis have publicly available uh, SLAs. Uh, for example, Google Cloud and Azure Cloud sees it is 99.95% available all the time. So chaos engineering is a practice which actually helps you to verify if you're able to provide that kind of an SLA and be available all the time. And by definition, there are a lot of definitions on the internet that you can see. This, there are a couple of ones that I've picked. It, it basically says it is a, a method by which you're testing a distributed computing system so that it can um, such that it can um, withstand unexpected disruptions. You're testing if um, some of the components or some of the um, assumptions that you had when you built the code. For example, you always thought the network is always going to be alive. You have unlimited compute, storage, bandwidth. That's not often the case. There are failures that happen all the time. And uh, we need to check if we can withstand the disruption. We can recover quickly enough and continue to provide the service at an acceptable level to the users. And uh, chaos engineering is not about reckless fault injection. It's a scientific process by which you identify a control group, an experimental group. You inject faults in a very uh, uh, controlled way. You basically ensure that there is minimal blast radius when you're injecting faults. And uh, then basically you see what happens. You try to learn about the system. Sometimes you go with hypothesis uh, that is proved. Sometimes it is disproved. If it is disproved, it is better. That means there is something that you learned newly. You can go back and fix your application. Or you can go back and fix your deployment practices. Maybe you can improve uh, the underlying infrastructure and make it more um, resilient. There are a lot of things you can do. Repeat your experiments, gain confidence, etc. So that is generally the practice of chaos engineering. Because of the times that we are living in today, um, I think with the pandemic, uh, probably this is a better analogy. It is like a vaccine. We inject harm and try to build immunity from outages. That's what we try to do. The standard chaos experiment flow is like this. You identify some steady state conditions. That's uh, part of your hypothesis. You see how much deviation there is going to be from your steady state, if at all. How quickly you are expected to recover. And then you go ahead with the fault injection. Verify if the hypothesis is right. If it is, that means you're going to go to the next font. Maybe it's a more complex font that you're going to test. Um, you might uh, call yourself or call your system rather resilient to this font that you injected and then you move on to the next one. Or if there is um, a weakness that you found and your hypothesis was disproved, then you go back to the drawing board and check what went wrong, what needs to be better, and make those fixes and then repeat once again. Chaos engineering is traditionally, has been traditionally done in production um, for a long time. That was the philosophy. Chaos engineering is most effective and useful when you do it in production. The principles of chaos tells as much. But um, with the recent proliferation of uh, Kubernetes and uh, the evolution of the cloud native paradigm, wherein a lot of organizations are re-architecting their 
uh, applications. They have been taking from taking away from the monolith model and creating everything as microservices. They're containerizing it. They're running it in new deployment environments, mostly Kubernetes. So there's a lot of apprehension about how things are going to work, and um, probably folks are not ready to do chaos engineering in production from the get go. Uh, there's a lot of projection and chaos experimentation that is done in pre production environments to gain confidence before it is really done in production. That is the change that we've seen happening in the chaos engineering world uh, in the last couple or so years. And we mentioned the Adrian Popra from Netflix and Amazon uh, in the beginning of this discussion. Uh, there is a principle that uh, Adrian is a big advocate of called as the chaos first principle. So it is about doing chaos engineering in a more ubiquitous and a democratic way you start doing it in development environments, you start doing it in staging and production. Maybe you add, add failure tests as part of your CI pipeline, CI CD pipelines, and uh, you basically do SLO validations based on uh, or during uh, uh, chaos experimentation. Basically, you go and validate whether your system uh, continues to stay alive and your objectives are met. So, this level objectives are met under duress. Uh, before, let's say, your application is moved into production. And then probably when you mature, you start doing the actual game days, uh, chaos experiments in your production environment and try and see uh, whether your system holds up there. So that is what we're seeing happen in the recent times. I mentioned about um, how Kubernetes and Cloud Native is a factor in getting people to do chaos engineering much before and earlier and often. Um, that's because in a Kubernetes-based deployment environment, there are so many variables, so many factors. Kubernetes itself is quite dense. There are a lot of content services. You're hosting that on top of some uh, platform infrastructure. Then you have a lot of tooling that you've pulled, a lot of frameworks that you've pulled from, you've pulled from the CNC landscape for service discovery, for um, monitoring, storage. Then you have your direct application dependencies, <coughs> your databases, message queues, then your app with all its services, microservices, your middleware, front facing, user facing services, etc. A lot of things can go wrong, and it is important that all these components work well in sync to provide the best user experience uh, that you have uh, guaranteed to the users of your service. So it is possible to test out varied scenarios and test it often. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, one of the, the pillars of the cloud native way of doing things is to release fast, um, to keep everything as microservices, to ensure that everything is declarative, everything has the Git as a source of truth. You have controllers that ensure your infra and your code in your source is synced always. So changes are happening in a fast pace. So you need chaos engineering to sort of uh, uh, borrow some philosophies from the, uh, the current model ensure that your chaos intent can be declarative, ensure that you automate uh, steady state hypothesis validation as part of the experiment run, ensure that it lends itself to GitOps, and um, uh, ensure that you have the same user experience uh, or same homogeneous experience that you have had while doing other things on Kubernetes. Uh, maybe you're talking about uh, defining application life cycles, security, or uh, uh, resource policies, Etc. Everything is defined as resources, and you have controllers in Kubernetes to manage that. And you would sort of like to break that into your chaos engineering as well. So that is uh, an introduction on what chaos engineering is generally, and what this category of cloud native chaos engineering is. Let me introduce you to the latest project. Uh, this is uh, an open source project which has been around for about um, three years or so now, and. Um, it provides you an end-to-end -end platform for doing chaos engineering on Kubernetes, and we've also started expanding it uh, or providing capabilities to do chaos against pre-Kubernetes or say non-Kubernetes infrastructure as well. Um, EC2 instances on AWS, GCP uh, VMs, uh, VMware machines, VMware uh, VMs, etc. So the um, Litmus platform runs as a set of microservices on Kubernetes. So it uses Kubernetes as the substrate to run the um, chaos uh, services, so to say. And you could make sure, you could pull some ready-made off-the-shelf 
experiments that are available in what we call as the chaos hub. The chaos hub is an open marketplace where you have a lot of uh, common scenarios that you would like to execute. You can pull the default templates, install them on your cluster, and uh, define a custom resource that maps the fault to any object on your cluster. It could be a node resource or a pod resource, and uh, you sort of uh, go from there. That's what uh, Litmus is about, um, very simply speaking. It has uh, a set of custom resources to define chaos and steady state validation at its heart. And it has a controller that reconciles these resources and carries out the chaos experiment or default injection business logic. And uh, there is a way uh, for you to uh, look at the results of the experiment so performed and uh, glean some information about how your applications are enterprise behaving. So uh, Litmus as a project was started, um, in fact, to serve the resilience test needs of another CNCF project called OpenEBS. And over a period of time, it uh, uh, sort of acquired a roadmap of its own, became more popular in the community. So we had requirements which so, sort of uh, uh, start coming in. And uh, we went from being a platform that can do chaos um, in, a, in a cloud native way. That is, you define intent in CR, and there's a controller that's going to carry out the experiment for you. From there, we went on to make it an end to end platform because chaos engineering has a lot of other requirements. Um, in terms of observability needs, in terms of defining blast radius in a very controlled way, uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of ensuring that your chaos results are being analyzed over a period of time to give you useful information that you can uh, generate about your system. There's some general KPIs associated with the chaos engineering practice, um, so help you glean some information uh, about how your KPIs are doing. Uh, as far as your practice goes. So some of that information we wanted to bring in and we also wanted to make it easy for folks to um, do complex experiments, maybe not simple faults. Um, maybe just, um, uh, you start off doing simple faults, of course, but sometimes you want to uh, generate complex conditions. Uh, you want to provide uh, the steady state validation intent as part of the experiment run. And sometimes there is a very diverse space of uh, verifying steady state. So you want to pack all of that in. So all that is about what we did uh, to get Litmus from its initial stage of the 1.x release to Litmus 2.0 or what it is now. So that's an introduction to the uh, philosophy of chaos and what Litmus is. Uh, I'd just like to see if there are any questions before I proceed. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. I Oh my gosh, so much to chew on. This is, this is great. Okay. So I, I just have a couple, these are lightweight questions that you'll be able to smash pretty quickly. I think when when most people think about testing an environment um, to, to maybe test as close to a real world example as possible, what they often consider is something like emulating a DDoS attack. Something outside is causing harm coming in, right? Now, if the kind of ingress layer, right? Um, and they are hitting certain API endpoints or uh, they are sending malformed requests, right? Um, they are doing something at maybe a higher level. And it sounds like what Litmus does actually runs in cluster, right? And this is kind of going back to chaos engineering. You're actually inflicting chaos from from yourself, like in internally, not externally, right? And so, you know, you mentioned Litmus has a, a few different types of maybe like attack library. And I'm actually looking at Gremlin as well, which is another uh, chaos engineering platform. Um, and I'm interested in some of the differences there. But what what you know, what is kind of the go to MO for the the default patterns that you find people using Litmus for? Um, and, and can you expand on a little bit of uh, what you're doing? It sounds like you're taking Litmus to the next level of building a platform. How do you intend to like leverage that platform to help provide continued reliability, insights, SLAs, things like that for not just your Kubernetes cluster or the API or an API, you know, for your application, right? Um, but more so for the entirety of a platform. If I, you know, I have 30 microservices, what does that look like? It's a great question. Um, yeah, so you, you're right about the first part. Uh, but I think Litmus, when it started, a lot of uh, members in the community um, started using it and still do predominantly a large set of users use it for 
inflicting some uh, chaos within the Kubernetes cluster and the services that are inside it. So Redmus uh, has this uh, feature to do some asset discovery, which we will show very shortly during the demonstration, where you can identify what are the different services that are uh, living inside of your cluster, and uh, you will be able to sort of access them, and sort of target them, and two different faults. For example, the generic category consists of most of the uh, pod level and Kubernetes node level faults. So you could um, uh, just kill pods, uh, send some termination signals to containers. You could uh, do some chaos on the pod network uh, by injecting latencies or eat up uh, resources and slow down the applications. Your PID one essentially running inside of your containers. And uh, similarly for nodes, you basically take it to maintenance, you drain it, or you cause an eviction taint and push out all the pods. So things that can be done in, in Kubernetes. And it has this model, especially in uh, 2.0, where you could run the control plane services within one cluster, uh, and you can register several other target environments or Kubernetes clusters into the control plane, and uh, you can run some agents there, which will actually carry out the pods. Um, there are ways uh, to keep the litmus pods immune from being impacted by the chaos it is generating, so you can target specific other pods you can have label or annotation selectors, namespace, um, namespace filters that you can use. And um, you can also set up some affinity policies and node selectors and things like that to ensure that uh, your, your application uh, services, litmus application services are not really impacted by the fault that it is causing. And you can really point uh, to specific resources against which you want to do chaos. But when you think about things happening outside of uh, your cluster, for example, um, you're talking about some application services which are receiving requests from an ingress, their requests from outside. Uh, so it also has the capability to go ahead and uh, ensure that the traffic is inhibited uh, against a certain destination addresses, probably. So let's say there is a service that is talking to, to a service inside of the cluster. You can ensure that the traffic between these services alone are disrupted, for example. That's something that you could do. That's uh, one thing that we developed recently. And a lot of uh, organizations still have a hybrid model. Not everything is on Kubernetes. So there are experiments that we've started creating for AWS, for example, where you can run the experiment business logic from inside of Kubernetes, so it runs as a pod. But we are making use of the API uh, that's provided by the uh, the cloud provider, for example, AWS or GCP or Azure, and uh, we can go ahead and invoke those APIs. They all provide very good SDK, so you can make sure that you can have some access secrets created on the Kubernetes cluster where the experiment business logic comes, and then you target uh, some non-Kubernetes resource that's completely elsewhere, and uh, still invoke the failures there. You can cause instance failures, disk attaches and also cause, uh, uh, let's say, resource burn or network degradation within those PMs there, which may or may not be running Kubernetes. So that way, you would still run Litmus uh, from within the uh, Kubernetes control plane, and uh, you would still be able to target resources that exist outside of Kubernetes. So that, that's the uh, model that we are sort of working towards. And uh, there are a limited set of experiments on uh, AWS and GCP and VMware and Azure. And uh, we are in the process of expanding those experiments uh, and the faults that you could do on non Kubernetes so that you get sort of a wholesome um, uh, platform. Uh, you're able to use the same centralized platform for doing chaos on different kinds of targets. So uh, that is, uh, you brought up Gremlin, which is uh, another great tool, um, which, uh, which has been around for quite some time. And um, they have added capabilities to uh, do Kubernetes-based chaos as well. Although they primarily started out as um, um, doing chaos against VMs. Um, so that is, we are, I think the chaos engineering community and the tools in the open source as well as the uh, closed source space are really growing today. Litmus is differentiated uh, in terms of its uh, architecture um, in how it runs as a Kubernetes app. 
as well as uh, the way in which it treats and experiment. Uh, so what we're trying to do is align with the, the principles of chaos and um, provide an end-to-end -end experiment, the notion of a complete experiment that has fault injection uh, as a, at its core, but also has blast radius, um, control, uh, ability to do steady state validation, ability to simulate um, complex scenarios by sort of stitching together experiments. So you could actually go ahead and um, run more than one fault. Let's say you have a node which is uh, almost exhausted with resources, there's nothing much that can be scheduled there. Then you have another node in which there was, let's say, an eviction that happened, uh, or let's say there's a there's a part that got uh, deleted there because of some reason, and you're not able to get scheduled anywhere else uh, because there's another node which is already running to full capacity. So this is a condition that is sometimes seen in production. You might want to bring up this scenario. It's a complex scenario. You might have to do two fonts and uh, tie the right validation along with this. So it was enables that through what we call as request workflows. So it, it um, to summarize, we're trying to build what is an uh, end to end chaos platform for doing complex experiments and also visualize the progress of the experiments. And you mentioned about how can I um, get information? So how can organizations try and take a look at how their um, chaos engineering practice is going? Does it have an overall resonance view? That's what we're trying to build with uh, uh, Litmus as well. So there is an analytics section here which goes through all the past workflows that you have run against your services. Then you will have um, a comparison that you can do against, uh, you might have run these workflows or experiments against different environments, maybe dev staging and production, or maybe across several releases. So you are trying to validate this, you're trying to uh, compare how your experiments went and uh, see whether you're improving or whether you're going down. So that is something that we're trying to add. So there are other views, the other viewpoints that we're trying to add here based on community feedback as to what is what they're most interested in when they're running experiments. For example, people would like to see how their application behaves. We'll see that in one of the demos where, uh, okay, there's something that I'm peering into my application dashboard. Now I want to see when chaos is actually running. Uh, when did it start? When did it end? And how the application behaved during this process? So that's some amount of observability that we're trying to add into the um, into the platform as well. So there are some um, uh, dashboards you can add within the Litmus Chaos Center, as we call it, and there's something that you can sort of use directly to instrument your reform dashboards, etc. So th that's how we are trying to um, improve the gotcha. platform. I sure. Abs yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much for getting into that. And some of the, this platform, you know, this UI really helps seal the deal in terms of what am I actually getting from an end-to-end -end perspective. Um, I think the analytics, like you need to be able to measure progress, right? Where am I at now? What is my desired state? And what, what are the incremental changes or pieces um, to getting to what my desired state is, whether that is you know, with being able to support so many requests per second or being able to sustain failures of uh, database connections or whatever it might be, right? So I think, uh, you know, principlesofchaos.org, uh, you've heard Karthik mention it a couple of times. I think that's a good starting point. That's actually a GitHub project as well. Um, there's literally just search chaos engineering on Google. You can find tons of great resources uh, that kind of look like what what Karthik and, and I have been talking about here and why this is so important. The other thing I wanted to mention too, uh, Karthik, is a lot of people don't really understand why do I need chaos engineering? What, what, why do I need that, right? Like what, I'm not going in, no one in our, our S3 team is gonna go in and just delete pods. No one's gonna go and mess with external name objects in Kubernetes or uh, screw with our CNI. Uh, Damon said, like, no one's going to do that, right? And it's not about the humans as much as it is, like, the natural elements of a cluster and, and you know, the churn, what's going on. There's maintenance, there's updates, there's auto-scaling, there are devs constantly deploying things, um, you know, there are people hopping in pods to look at things and test things, right? There are objects coming in and out. There's many different namespaces. So I think... The, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of talking about some of the SRE core principles here of assuming failure, uh, assuming failure and using measurements, strong measurements, SLAs, SLIs, SLOs to track your services, 
um, your endpoints. Um, and, and really, once you, you think about that and you think about maybe, a, let's say, because I have experience with an e-commerce platform uh, where uh, you've got at any given time, you might have a marketing event and have millions of people coming into your platform in the scope of five minutes. How are your applications going to work? And I've seen so many different sorts of problems where you, know, you can throw a compute at something, but if the things it depends on, if it can't get out to the internet, if the NAT gateway is, is broken, or if other services it depends on in the chain of doing its operations to do some processing and produce an output, if something is broken there, isn't scaling there as you'd expect, right? Uh, you're, you're not gonna know about that until it actually happens. And I fundamentally think that you, there is no way to anticipate problems until you have actually experienced them. Um, and so I think that chaos engineering basically is saying, you know, this is, you have to commit to being okay. And it, again, it's going to be scary, but um, things are never going to be perfect. You're never always going to have five instances of your application, 100% working perfect, so, you know, hitting health checks, responding in, you know, under, you know, one second, right? You're never going to have things uh, in, a, in a perfect capacity. And so what actually happens? What does that mean for your end users, for the people that are using your platform day in and day out, who you know might be buying something from it or depend on it for whatever reason? This is altogether making Kubernetes a better platform for you to continue, continually use ship applications and really get that feedback loop of analytics, uh, metrics and other data so you know what's actually going on, having that intelligence, right? It's not, it's not uh, maybe the older world where we're just like throw it on there and the services system CTL, great, the service is running and you know hopefully everything's good, right? Um, I think this is the new kind of model for thinking about how we do things, especially in a cloud native way. Um, so with that, I'm gonna give it back to you, Karthik. I think you've already shown us a little bit about the platform. Um, you, you probably wanna dive into uh, what some of the differences from 2.0 and 1.0. I'd love to hear more about, you know, what was the intent with 1.0 and what are yeah. some of the key things and learnings that that you and the team uh, leveraged to kind of figure out we want to do 2.0 and this is what it should be. Take us through that a little bit and I'm sure we'll have some questions from there. I know I have a few other questions as well, but take us through that. Sure. I think when we built 1.0, um, it was just, like I said, the need for us to be able to create uh, something that was cloud native to do chaos. So one of the things we felt was in Kubernetes, everything happens to be uh, a resource, either it is native or custom, and then you have a controller that reconciles things. So we want to bring that experience to Kubernetes, chaos engineering as well. And that's when we basically created some custom resources, um, something called Litmus Experiment CR, the engine and the result, of course, along with the controller uh, to carry out the chaos process. So this is a very brief summary of what it is. On the hub that I just showed you a few minutes back, there are a lot of uh, templates that you can pull, pre-built templates that define a particular fault. Then there is a chaos engine, the one that is user-defined, the one with, with which uh, users deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, where you provide a lot of run characteristics about the experiment and map a fault with some component uh, that is living on your cluster right now, which is either an intra component or service, or maybe in case of non-Kubernetes chaos, some instance uh, that is living somewhere on the cloud. So that's what you create and run. Um, so chaos engine is the one that actually triggers when creation of uh, creation of which triggers the fault injection process, and the results of uh, this experiment are stored in a chaos result. And we sort of create separate resources because there's a there's a huge scope for um, you know sort of um, expanding the schema and what all this can hold. Um, in case of chaos results, you can store the experiment status, the verdict of the experiment upon completion based on certain steady state validation constraints. You would like to know how each of those constraints worked when you ran the experiment. We use something called probes to define those constraints when you run the experiment. So how did they go? And then of course, to repeat the experiments in a, with uh, different scheduling options, you might want to randomize your experiment and run it over a prolonged period of time, either strictly scheduled or with some randomness thrown in. So these are all the chaos CRDs. So when we started with uh, chaos uh, engineering project Litmus, we had, let's say, this uh, part along this deployment alone called the chaos operator. The rest that we're seeing here is part of 2.0. Um, you initially had just the chaos operator. 
and uh, you could create a chaos engine manifest, something like this. You just have um, an application that you're defining by namespace, label, and the kind. These are the identifiers for a given application. And uh, you, you can basically go and uh, run this experiment with a specific service account. It was allows you to run your experiments with a defined set of permissions. So you can choose um, uh, who is doing the experiment and what permissions the persona has. And therefore, you can control what can be done as part of the experiment. Maybe provide permissions, just say to delete parts, maybe nothing more. So you cannot do a node level experiment. Uh, that way, Litmus lends itself to sort of um, a uh, self service model of experiments. Maybe there's a shared cluster, different service owners and developers are running their own experiments. You can still do that by adopting different service accounts. And then you have something like this uh, you have a total duration for which the chaos runs. And then you have some tunables uh, just to control the nature of the experiment. And we're going to do this experiment against a pretty simple service called as a Hello Service. It's a, basically a, a Hello World application that lives in demo space. Let me just uh, take you to that. It lives in a space in a space called demo space. It's just a part. What I'm going to show is like the Hello World of Chaos Engineering, where you just fill a part. With 1.x, uh, we provided this capability to create resources and run forms. So you can actually see the fault running. So people found it very convenient to make use of this uh, in their uh, uh, scripts and automation pipelines, uh, CI, CD, like, things like that. So you basically run the, the fault, uh, the duration happens. Uh, a few times, we just set uh, 30 seconds duration, 10 second intervals, it's going to do the kills two, three times. And um, you're going to get a chaos result, and then you're going to get some events on the chaos engine resource that might be of interest. So you can actually see what's happening as part of the experiment. Um, it, it does a pre chaos check, each experiment in Litmus does a pre chaos check to see if the application that we're doing chaos on is in good state because we don't want to degrade an already degraded system. So we make some checks and then we carry out the fault, then we do some post checks and then we finish the experiment. That, that is essentially what uh, was available. Um, you can see the chaos injection is in progress, like, like I showed you. So this is going to complete the experiment and then just uh, allow you to take, uh, take a look at the results and see what happened to your applications. You, you have your own inferences that you can draw from what has happened. So that is what we had. You get the summary based on the constraints. There are no constraints essentially in this experiment. So it's said the experiment passed because the only checks that we used to verify that it passed is whether the app was good before and whether it recovered after within a specific period of time. But um, as we went along, and I think I just uh, missed showing you the chaos result. So the chaos result is quite simplistic um, in this case. Then we just have one result in the name. So you can see that uh, the experiment was run once it passed, and this was the target, and um, it, it just ran. Right? So this is very something that's very simple. Uh, but real world uh, scenarios uh, are more different, and real world, re real world requirements are uh, more different. So we sort of got that feedback as we went along uh, the building the project in the open. So we were asked. Uh, how can I visualize the impact of chaos? I have an application dashboard and I want to see exactly when chaos starts, when it ends. Um, sort of how do I visualize the impact of chaos? And I want to see what stage it is in. Um, so of course, the events are helpful, but events is not for everybody. Uh, there are a lot of Kubernetes has really democratized the way applications are operated. Uh, so there are different personas involved there. Uh, there are some folks who are very deep involved and uh, know the Kubernetes API, very happy to navigate around things like logs and events. There are others who are looking at more graphical representations of a process, um, dashboards. So how, how do I visualize the impact of chaos? Uh, and then how do I basically validate application behavior? The verdict that you're telling me is too simplistic. Um, application health check, application recovery after chaos is great, but I want to see what's happening during the fault injection. I, I have some um, SLOs that I want to val validate, maybe some IOPS throughput. 
latency that I want to validate even as the experiment runs. How can I go ahead and do more faults? Uh, maybe as part of a larger scenario, like you mentioned some, some minutes back, we talked about a case where your node is run to exhaustion and there's another correlation happening elsewhere, you're stuck, you're not in what is in pending state. How do I simulate these kind of scenarios? How do I do benchmarking? Uh, I think um, Mario mentioned about um, these uh, cases where there's thousands of users using your platform at a single point of time. How do I, how do you simulate that load and then do fault there? How does your system respond to faults under such loaded conditions? Is doing chaos in the uh, utopian uh, conditions is not, is not great. Uh, you don't want to do it in the ideal case, what would happen this traffic that's full? How do you do that? Basically, do multiple things at once as part of your experiments, a lot of parallel processes. And how do you tell me resilience? Uh, is there a metric that you can show and tell me this is how uh, your fault or your experiment and your application or service is connected? This is the metric that uh, you have uh, that says your application is resilient uh, to this fault by this level, by this much. right? And then there are other operational challenges. How do uh, I get different team members to come and collaborate on my chaos artifacts and visualize it? Um, how do I ensure that uh, there's a single source of truth for my case experiments? YAMLs are great, you can store them in Git, but uh, GitOps is really the in thing. Uh, I want to ensure that there's a change made on my Git and the experiment definition needs to get changed on my cluster when it is run. So how do you ensure that? Um, how do you use a single platform to target different environments? We built upon this a little bit, doing chaos in Kubernetes, but also doing chaos against other components while still running as an app on Kubernetes. Uh, so how do you do all this? So these were the requirements that we got. Um, uh, and we sort of spoke to the community and there are several meetups where we went and presented and we got talking to people. And this is what we brought back into the project and built uh, with Litmus 2.0. So the, the result is um, a, an architecture which basically gives you uh, a, a single centralized uh, cross cloud control plane, we would like to call it. It's like a centralized management platform where you can connect one or more target environments of chaos. Depends on where you want your chaos to be done. I have a fleet of clusters, but I can use a single management platform to manage chaos against it. So you have uh, the self agent. So this is the cluster on which the portal or the chaos center is installed. It automatically registers itself as um, a candidate for, for a target environment for chaos. And then you could uh, add other clusters as well uh, for doing chaos. Essentially, this is an execution plane. You could do your chaos business logic on the same uh, cluster where the Kubernetes uh, control plane for chaos resides, that is where the, where the chaos center resides. But we can also use a different cluster as an execution plane. So by doing that, you're able to discover microservices sitting on that cluster. But you're just... Um, uh, making use of, you could also just be making use of that to run uh, your pods, your KS pods, targeting something that's stored in our Kubernetes at all also. And uh, we have this ability to create workflows now, instead of a, a single chaos engine that you saw getting created, you can create a workflow that can stitch together more than one chaos engine in a different order, in parallel or in sequence. And you can also have load tests embedded within a workflow. Uh, you could probably use Locust or Vegeta or K6 IO or uh, a lot of other tools, FIO probably, um, that runs maybe as a job, Sysbench, things like that that we know that the community is using today. And that can be run if you can containerize them and run that as a pod. You can run that as one of the processes in the workflow along with the experiment so you get uh, a better scenario that you test. And we also have the analytics, uh, which uh, does a comparison of workflows um, against what is called as a resilience score. So the resilience score is essentially a metric that uh, connects your experiment and your service. So the resilience score is uh, created or, or calculated depending upon uh, some importance or weightage that you give to an experiment. We'll see that very shortly. And, um, the success factor returned in the chaos result. Uh, success factor itself is dependent upon some steady state validation constraints that you define within the experiment using probes. So you take the success factor and the weightage that you gave to the experiment, you get a product. 
and you get a summation of that product for several experiments that are listed within a workflow divided by the total points possible and you get a residence score. And that residence score uh, is something that you can use and you can use that to compare over a period of time and you can see how your experiment is sort of improving or uh, whether it is uh, reducing its resilience, etc. So that is about the analytics. And um, it also has the option for you to sort of pick workflows, um, chaos artifacts from a Git repository. Uh, so you can commit workflows that you constructed on the, on the chaos center, on this wizard that uh, is provided with the chaos center. And that gets committed into your Git repositories. And any changes made there gets reflected here. Uh, and uh, the next time you run the workflow, you're running it with the new spec, uh, modified spec that you're running. And uh, it also has um, a, uh, a set of users uh, that you can uh, that bring together as part of your team to collaborate in chaos. And uh, each uh, individual gets a project into which he can invite users to form his team, his or her team. And uh, the uh, the users can have several types. Uh, you could create a user who's an admin, a view only ad admin, or just or an editor, etc. There are different levels of users that you can use, and you can collaborate on chaos. So, and it also has the chaos hub embedded within it, uh, very much inspired by the OpenShift uh, operator hub that's embedded within OpenShift for Artex. Um, so we have the embedded chaos hub here. So when you construct new workflows, you can actually pick experiments from the hub and stitch them together and run it. So these are all the capabilities that we created in response to the requirements that we gathered. I'll do a very quick set of demonstrations to show you how you can leverage this um, uh, Mario was talking about uh, e-commerce applications. Uh, we've taken the example of a sample e-banking app called the Bank of Anthos, um, which is comprised of several microservices. Uh, you can see um, that I have Bank of Anthos in the default namespace on this cluster. I have Lens here just to make things easy uh, in terms of visualization. So you can see that there's a balance reader application uh, or service rather, which is allowing me, enabling me to read the balance here, make payments, do all sorts of things. I have set this application up without much resilience. And what I'm going to do is inject a black hole attack, something like a D, a very similar to a DDoS attack. Maybe uh, we're going to inhibit the balance reader service. And um, that's going to give us a semi or quasi operational e banking application, which is something you generally want to avoid. So you can take a look how we do it. We are just scheduling the workflow and selecting an execution environment. I'm selecting the same cluster as where my chaos center resides. And uh, I go ahead and uh, select the chaos hub from where I can pick my experiments. You can define your own hub here as well. If you're in a private environment, you can create your own chaos hub and pick experiments from there. Um, and then you go ahead and give a name. I'm going to call it back of uh, and those back hole. And um, we're just going to pick an experiment. Um, in this case, network loss is the experiment I'm going to use to create this attack. So once I've selected the um, uh, experiment, I can go ahead and tune it the way I need. So I am interested in the balance reader service residing on the default namespace. So I'm just going to select that. I have the option of validating uh, some behavior as I do the for, but I just keep it simple for this first run. I'm just going to say next, and I'm going to keep it um, intact, the for intact for 60 seconds. This is going to be 100% network loss that we're going to inject. So I'm going to say finish, uh, and I'm going to say reverse schedule force. So this is basically a feature that uh, cleans up your chaos resources or your custom resources that were created to do the fault afterwards. I'm going to keep them just to show you the logs. And uh, this is the step I said where you can provide the weightage or criticality to your experiment. I'm going to give it all points. You can do the fault once now, or you can do a recurring schedule. And um, what we're going to do is just do the fault once now. And this is going to give us an Argo workflow underneath. So it's going to construct an Argo workflow where it has a couple of steps to pull the fault template for network loss and then actually run the experiment. You can see the chaos engine is auto uh, configured or, or created. You don't have to create it by hand. 
Uh, you can see the same thing as we saw last time with the port delete that we did a few minutes back. Uh, we have the balance reader being targeted in a particular namespace, and we have the duration and other tunables for the fault. And I'm just going to say finish. So this is going to run the workflow. You can visualize what is happening uh, as you do the fault. And uh, each step is going to get uh, laid out on the cluster through a couple, some transient parts that get created. You can see it first pulls the fault template, and then it actually um, does the uh, the trigger of the of the chaos itself. At this point, Banco Anthos looks healthy and good. So once the fault starts running, you will be able to see that we cannot read the balance or make payments. So like I said, uh, sometime back, uh, Litmus does some pre-chaos and post-chaos checks. At this point, the pre-chaos checks is to see whether the parts that carry this label that we just described is healthy and it is alive before it actually starts doing the fault. You can see that the step to trigger the fault has started. You can use the, um, the chaos engine schema is, is quite rich. You can do a lot of things with it. Um, the documentation for that is available here. You can take a look at um, the um, concepts section and you can see all the, the specifications that it contains and all that can be tuned. So you, you can take a look at these sections here uh, to see what all is tunable. You can set resources, you can define affinity policies for where this pod has to run. You can inject annotations into it. You can define the, the, the amount of time that you spend trying to validate whether an application is alive. A lot of things can be tuned, but if setup is something very simple. The fault is active at this point. So if I refresh this uh, application, you can see it cannot read the balance. And uh, I try to make a payment, uh, but that shouldn't go through um, because I cannot read the balance to see how much I have in my wallet to actually make the payment. So these are some things we would dearly like to avoid in our applications. We need to find the uh, have the right middleware probably to direct us to a different replica that is working um, and ensure things work. And it is always risky when you have semi-operational uh, uh, applications. For example, I'm able to make deposits, but I can't read how much I have deposited. Things like that. So this was a very uh, quick demonstration of how you can inject a fault and uh, how it runs. And you will see I that think. this experiment yeah. This was uh, this was wonderful. Sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to. I think so. I think a lot of people think of down and up, and they think binary about how a platform is operating. It's it's just it's it's black and white, right? And that's not actually how most outages work. Most outages are actually kind of like a a, a brownout, like a like a some things are working, some things are not working. The problem is that the totality of maybe some of the critical flows. For using an application, this example is fantastic that you that you use. Is that some things might stop working, right? And and things might seem okay, but when a user actually goes to do something, that's when uh, dependency services, other API endpoints that are called, um, and certain right. microservices that make up the overall platform are not doing their job as is expected. And I think that's one of the major use cases for this. I'm loving this workflow dashboard. I think this makes it easy for me to. Yeah, kind of again, you know, obviously the schedule interface you have here, uh, some of the agents and the hub stuff is fantastic. So it's all tied together, um, uh, kind of all unified interface. Um, and I think like this is the next evolution of what it looks like to be comfortable feeling like you have the control to test your environment in the way you need to to really get the, the correct signal uh, instead of just noise about like, oh, well, you got this one pod using lots of resources. Uh, you know, that's one of many little things going on, but there's a lot more signal that you need around the, the flows, I think, and what's actually happening um, in these certain scenarios. So this is fantastic to see. Karthik, will you click around a little bit? I'm gonna ask a couple of lightweight questions because we have just a, a yeah. few minutes left. Um, I think one of the, the big ones here uh, that I'm thinking about is what is some of the key things? What is the next step? And, and you did a great job of talking about like what 2.0 is delivering versus one point. 
Uh, oh, and and so like, what are the what's next on the roadmap? What can we see here over the next uh, few months as we end you know end of the year? What should what what is Litmos like looking to uh, implement that has been like something you know huge that a lot of users have maybe been talking about or things that you've been asked about from from people saying like, hey, you know, I'm using this, and if it did X, Y, and Z. Uh, I would be so much more efficient, or I'd be able to to really nail down certain things. What do those things look like for you and the team? That's a great question. So, <clears throat> one of the things that we we're being asked is to improve. It's exactly what you mentioned. Uh, it's about you want to see what's happening to your applications. It's it's not about it's it's not um, binary. It's 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 brown out generally, and you want to validate a lot of things get uh, insights into a lot of things that's happening on the cluster even as you do the fault. So probes is one thing that we introduced to help do that. For example, in this case, I'm just repeating the fault that we did in the 1.x experiment where we're trying to kill a pod, but along the way we are doing some checks. We are checking whether a downstream application is always alive. I am basically checking if uh, it, it's, it's always going to be alive there's a 200 OK that I get against it for a polling interval of every one second. If it is not, uh, then probably I would like to abort the experiment. So you can say stop and fail you true. Uh, so these are things, how do, how do I abort based on conditions? How can I have a dead man's switch? So to say, as I run the fault to sort of auto stop. And what are the different kinds of probes that I can run? Uh, I, I, I can run Prometheus probes today. That's um, basically using Prometheus metrics to check deviation in your steady state, maybe is it, is it under your SLOs or no? So add a pro support for different kinds of probes that work with different observability tools that are there in the in, in the CNC landscape today. That's one of the things that we're being asked um, and we're working towards. And uh, more experiments for non-Kubernetes environments. So that's something that we are working towards as well. Um, Azure, AWS, uh, GCP, uh, these are some of the uh, VMware, these are some of the environments where people are still running a lot of their services in. And um, we have an uh, initial set of experiments there, but there's a request for being able to add more. And from uh, folks that who are uh, trying to use this in enterprise environments, we also want uh, support for different kinds of authentication and authorization mechanisms as, uh, as to how uh, people can access the chaos center and run it. So that is one of the things that we are looking forward into the uh, adding to the roadmap as well. And there are other fault types within Kubernetes that we can add. The, the faults uh, are like uh, thousands of faults that you can actually do uh, using a base set of faults. You can create thousands of scenarios rather. Uh, so Litmus provides you a good set in the Chaos Hub, but we are uh, committed to increasing that uh, set of faults for. Kubernetes and non-Kubernetes, and also provide uh, a resilience, a better resilience view uh, that people can make use of. Um, analytics and resilience scores are great, uh, but there are a lot of other things people would like to know about uh, when they run the experiments. So probes are a step in that direction. People also want to know things about uh, how their recovery was, how much time did it take really. Maybe it, it was under the limits, but how much under the limits? Uh, is, there, is that something that people can improve upon? Um, how do you get better? How do you provide better insights uh, to people who are practicing chaos engineering? That, that's something that we are uh, we're, we're going towards. That's awesome. So, this is all fantastic. Yeah, we just have one more minute. Uh, I want to end on a strong note for people that are looking to dip their toes in and get started, and maybe even evangelize this a little bit in their organization or play around in a. Uh, Kind of lower end environment, like a dev environment, a playground. What what would you say? What's kind of the the best way for them to get started understanding chaos engineering and starting to leverage it in their day to day on their laptops, whatever they're trying to do? Uh, what are some resources? Yeah, I think uh, we have um, done a fair bit of refactoring on the docs as well as part of the OneRotex two two dot o. So this is the docs.reference.chaos.io. There are a uh, lot of resources here that you can use to learn. Uh, some of it is still coming in, but there's a good uh, set of uh, um, uh, good set of uh, concepts docs that you, you can use here 
to learn about Bitmus. And um, you also have experiment documentation. There's a lot of information about how you can run each experiment, the different tunables that it provides, and how you can run it with different options. All that information, for example, is, we talk about pod delete. Um, there are different ways in which you can run pod delete, a lot of which is explained here. So this, I, I would recommend are um, a couple of good resources, the docs and the, the GitHub pages of the repository itself. Um, that's about where you can find information about Ritmus. But when it comes to general information about chaos engineering, uh, you can take a look at the principles of chaos engineering. And CNCF has just got started with a chaos engineering work group, um, which uh, is uh, trying to actively put together information about chaos engineering for beginners and uh, for, for practitioners uh, who've been doing chaos engineering for a long time and then jump into the cloud native world and you know, looking at doing chaos engineering in a cloud native way. We meet uh, uh, once in uh, two weeks and uh, we're trying to put together a white paper that talks about um, chaos engineering. Uh, there is uh, some information, for example, if you're looking at uh, common terminologies associated with chaos engineering, there's a dictionary that we're, we're creating. Uh, it talks about uh, uh, chaos engineering. It's not really an alphabetically sorted uh, glossary. It's more about chaos engineering um, as you learn it. So you sort of come to principles and then you talk about what is an experiment and how you can uh, sort of uh, understand each part of the experiment, um, blast radius, hypothesis, SLIs, and SLOs, and how you can practice it uh, as an SRE, how you can conduct game days, uh, information that we're trying to expand upon. Um, so this is probably a good space to look out for. Excellent. For sure. Yeah, this is perfect. I did not know there was a working group. That is amazing to hear. Um, thank you very much, Karthik. So much great content today. You really did some amazing demos as well. And the demo gods were clearly with you. Uh, LitmusChaos.io, um, Chaos Native um, is the company. Um, thank you to Karthik today. And thank you for the, the people working behind the scenes. My name is Mario Loria. It's been a great pleasure to host uh, today's session and talk to everybody later. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.